Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Rachel Kinderdine, the Community Manager at the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program. We also have several exciting live stream events coming up, which we will highlight at the end of the program, but in case you aren't around at the end of the program, you can also find them on our website. It is now my pleasure to bring on Dan Schnur, political professor at UC Berkeley, USC, and Pepperdine. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? Hey, Rachel, how are you doing? Thanks I'm so much for so much so much. Thanks so so much for stepping in. We wouldn't even known we wouldn't have even known that Kim wasn't here. So <laughs> I uh, appreciate taking that. over. <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to tonight's topic, which is the issues that will decide the midterm elections. And just a quick reminder for our audience, in about half an hour, I'll come back on for the Q&A, where we'll answer your questions. If you could enter your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, I will get to as many of them as possible. Excellent. Well, Rachel, I'll look forward to seeing you again in a little bit, but uh, off, off we go. See so you Okay, so the one other the one other reminder that I'd offer to all of you, and by the way, before we even get to reminders, we should start with thank yous, because as always, I'm really grateful to how many of you join us uh, for these monthly programs. But this month, and then again in November, given the import of this fall's elections, we're adding extra programming. So we're actually going to do two October webinars, the first right now, of course, but the second one, two weeks from today on October 25th, and then we'll do two more in November. So at both of these October programs, we're of course going to talk about the midterm elections before they take place. But we've divide, divided today's discussion and the program on the 25th in the following way. On the 25th, two weeks from today, we're gonna to talk about the candidates in the specific races that will be most impactful in deciding the outcome in the fight for control of Congress. We'll talk about the handful of key Senate races that will ultimately decide control of that chamber, and then look both at individual campaigns and broader trends that could end up influencing the outcome of the House races and ultimately that chamber's majority. So in two weeks, we're gonna talk about candidates in particular races, but what we thought made sense for today to get us started is to talk about the issues and in fact, the uh, matters of public policy that are shaping the national political conversation and use that as a setup for our conversation in a couple of weeks um, about the candidates. Now tonight, at least for the first portion of the program, I'm gonna focus primarily on national politics and on the battle for control of Congress. Obviously there is no shortage of critically important ballot initiatives at the state level this year even if the governors and Senate races don't look to be particularly competitive. And for those of you here in the greater Los Angeles area, you know that local politics here has been turned absolutely upside down in the last few days, given the controversy that's emerged out of City Hall. So if any of you do decide that you'd like to talk or ask about California state politics or Los Angeles local politics later in the program, of course, I'm happy to answer those questions for you or to do my best in answering them. But given that we do draw such a considerable audience from other parts of the state and other parts of the country, we will begin this by talking about, uh, about national politics and again, about the, the battle, the fight for control of Congress, given the extraordinarily small margins of majority that the Democrats still have. Republicans won't need many gains at all in fact, just one seat in the U.S. Senate, as all of you know, and just a handful of seats uh, in the House to turn the majority. And if you look back at history, which I like to do for guidance on these types of things, if you look back at history, and we've talked about this before, midterm elections are almost always very difficult challenges for the party that controls the White House because the president's party, generally speaking, tends to suffer from a lack of motivation. And even if things are going well, when you're part of the party in charge, you're pretty happy about that. And so maybe you're a little bit less excited and a little bit more ins less inspired. But when you're in the minority party, you're hungry. Maybe you're a little bit angry and you're very motivated 
So over the years, that motivational advantage almost always tends to create a real benefit for the out party, the party that doesn't control the White House. And in fact, and I think some of you have heard me talk about this before also, in fact, there have only been three midterm elections in the last 100 years, in the last century, in which the president's party actually gained seats in those midterms rather than lost seats. The most recent of those three occurrences was in 2002, when George W. Bush and the Republican Party realized gains in midterms that took place barely a year after the terrorist attacks of September 11th. And because voter concerns about national security and terrorism in particular were so intense, Republicans used those concerns as a way of gaining seats in those midterm elections. Four years before that, in 1998, Bill Clinton's Democratic Party was able to realize gains as well, primarily because voters, most voters, perceived Republicans as having overreached in their impeachment of Bill Clinton that year. And the backlash against Republicans for the Clinton impeachment provided Democrats an opportunity that otherwise might not have been available to them. But before those two elections, in 1998 and 2002, you have to go all the way back to 1934 to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first midterm elections, still at the heights of the Great Depression, of course, and at a time when Roosevelt and the Democratic Congress were just beginning to move the New Deal through Congress, that voters very, very frightened by the economic circumstances bolstered temporarily Roosevelt's Democratic majorities. So looking back over the last century of American politics, what do we see? We see that it takes an extraordinary event an impeachment, a terrorist attack, a Great Depression for a president's party to gain seats in a midterm election. Now, Republicans will tell you that history is working in their favor. Democrats will tell you, however, that there may be extraordinary events happening this year that could lead to the same kind of unusual result that we saw in the three previous elections that I referenced. Well, what are those extraordinary events? The first one is the first one, no surprise, is former President Donald Trump. Normally, after leaving office, a former president tends to maybe not completely retire from the political scene, but to take a relatively low profile role. No surprise to any of us, whether you're a strong Trump supporter or opponent, that Trump is not taking a low profile in these elections at all, just the opposite. And in fact, as we've talked about many times before, Donald Trump continues to be the nation's motivator in chief, motivating both his own supporters and his opponents to turn out in numbers that would otherwise probably not be the case. So a lot of Democrats believe that the president, the president, former President Trump's presence in the race, the January 6th congressional hearings, which will continue this Thursday, the controversy over the uh, confidential documents that Trump took from the White House to Mara Logo after leaving office in January of 2021. Lots of Trump-related stuff that many Democrats believe could create the same kind of dynamics that we talked about in 1934, 1998, and 2002. And of course, the other uh, very extraordinary event was the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade this past spring. And the Dobbs decision is unprecedented in, Ameri in American history because at no other point in our history has a Supreme Court made such a seminal ruling so close to an election. We're seeing that the abortion issue in the wake of the Dobbs decision really is playing to the Democrats' uh, favor. And while most prognosticators still believe that Republicans maintain an advantage going into ne next month's elections. One or both of these occurrences could certainly have the same kind of effect, the same kind of beneficial effect to the Democrats as the three elections that I've talked about previously. So let's look, let's take a look back over the course of the last several months to see how this election has played out. Then I wanna hear your opinions. And so hopefully Katie's ready in just a moment uh, to put up our first questions, but before we do, Let's look back over the last several months and how these events have played out. Well, if we'd been having this conversation, say, in April, 
back in April, inflation was raging. The president's popular, President Biden's popularity numbers were favorability ratings were very, very low. And it looked then like history would hold and Republicans were poised not only to regain their majorities, but regain their majorities by some fairly significant margins. That was last spring. By the end of the summer, say we'd been having this conversation in August, by then inflation had begun to drop, particularly gasoline prices had fallen off. And the nation had been roiled by the court's decision on abortion rights. And it appeared that the Dobbs decision would be an extraordinary event that motivated Democrats to a much greater degree than parties in power normally, normally felt. But that was April, that was August. Here we are in October, and as many of you may have noticed, gasoline prices are going up again. And while the Dobbs decision clearly had a tremendous impact on a large portion of the electorate, there is polling evidence that as the months have passed, it might not be as much of a motivational issue as it was over the summer. So who is the better chances right now? Well, we don't know. But what we are seeing in this election cycle is we're seeing something very unusual. And that is given the importance of the inflation issue to many voters, given the issue of the importance of the abortion issue to many voters, what we're essentially seeing is two separate elections taking place along parallel tracks. Normally, the two parties, whether in a midterm or a presidential election, they battle over the issues. They try to convince voters, at least those voters in the middle of the political spectrum, that their solution is better than the other parties on the issues of greatest concern. That's not what's happening this year. What's happening this year instead is the Democrats and Republicans are conducting their respective campaigns as if the other side simply didn't exist. Republicans are talking almost not, uh, are talking predominantly about economic issues, especially inflation, although a little bit also about crime and immigration policy, and we'll come back to that later too. And Democrats, at least in their paid advertising, are talking almost exclusively about abortion rights, a little bit on gun violence and some other issues, but essentially you have one campaign over here on inflation, one campaign over here on abortion, and the two of them have very little to do with each other. So Katie, let's do this. Let's ask our group, knowing that the dynamic of this election is such an unusual one, let's find out from them, what's the most important issue in this election to you? Uh, is it option one, inflation and economic issues? Is it option two, abortion and health issues? Now, while those are the two issue sets that are dominating the election, we did want to give you a chance to weigh in on other key policy matters. So option three is immigration and border issues. Option number four is for other foreign policy and international issues, Ukraine, Russia, China, Middle East, North Korea, plenty going on in the world stage that's getting almost no attention in this campaign. And then finally, I mentioned Trump briefly earlier, um, but is the former president and the January 6th riots and the related controversies, such as those I mentioned earlier, is that the most important issue to you? So Katie, what did we get for our, what did we get for our answer from our group? Well, very interesting. I have to tell you, uh, I'm not very surprised by this, but I'm surprised that the margins are as close as they are. 37% of our group, which we know from previous experience, does tend to lean just a bit leftward, and sometimes more than a bit, 37, just a little bit more than one third of our group says that abortion and health issues will be the most important uh, uh, policy matter in this campaign. 26% put Trump related issues, January 6th, the, the uh, confidential documents and so on. 21%, somewhat lower than we see in national polling, believe that inflation and economic issues are the most important. And obviously for Republicans to win, they're going to have to boost those numbers, maybe not with our group, but in the country at large. And well behind, 16%, 16 say foreign policy and international matters. And only one single one of our group here today identified immigration and border policy as the most important issue. Once again, that's an issue that clearly does work to the Republicans' benefit. And since we do know that our group does tend to uh, position itself just a bit left of the overall electorate, it shouldn't be surprising that the issues that the Democrats are emphasizing, abortion and Trump, 
did get the highest response from our group. But let's go forward. So what do we know? Uh, let's talk, we'll, we'll talk about the economy for a minute and then we'll go on to abortion. Um, what do we know about economic issues and how voters react to changing economic circumstances? Well, we know that generally speaking, the president, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, usually gets much too much credit when things are good and way too much blame when things are bad. And we're in a somewhat unusual circumstance right now in that unemployment is very low. In fact, unemployment is at historic lows, but inflation is extremely high. And this is the first significant bout with inflation that our country has seen on a sustained basis in decades. So actually a majority of the voters in this election, this is the first time they've been navigating high inflation as a challenge in their own lives. So it's not surprising that voters are so concerned about it. And it's not surprising that the Republicans are emphasizing it to such a degree. Now, Republicans blame Biden for the inflation. They believe that his Infrastructure Act and some of the post-COVID spending that he, in which he, uh, uh, which he had supported has, uh, uh, has contributed to rising inflation rates. Biden talks about the war in Ukraine and blames Vladimir Putin to a large degree uh, for the increase in gasoline prices. But at least right now, perhaps not in our group, but across the country, right now, voters give a much more trust on economic issues to Republicans. If the election were simply going to be a referendum on the economy, Republicans have a very substantial margin of advantage at this point. But let's ask our group too, even if we don't reflect exactly uh, the mood of the country. Katie, if we can, uh, uh, if we can put up the second question, um, who do you trust more to handle issues relating to inflation and taxes, job creation and economic growth? Do you trust, trust Democrats more on economic issues? Do you trust Republicans more? Do you trust them both equally? Or frankly, don't you trust either one at all? And Katie, when those, we got those results, let's see what our group had to say. Again, nationally, we know that the voters tend to put more trust in Republicans, I suspect our answer is going to be more than a little bit different. Whoa, 53%, more than half of our group gives more, has more faith in the Democrats' ability to handle inflation and economic policy. Only 13% says Republicans, 29% say this, the cynics among us say neither, and, only, uh, and then 6% say both equally. So once again, uh, we have a very, very intelligent group. I've learned that over the years of doing this program. But because of, our group doesn't necessarily reflect the ideological grounding of the national electorate as a whole, our results are going to be a little bit different. And so Republicans will, despite what we just saw in our own poll numbers, going to continue to hammer uh, inflation issues as well as immigration and crime policy as much as they can in the last four weeks before Election Day. Now, from a national perspective, the situation is completely reversed when we switch the conversation from inflation to abortion. Republicans don't want to talk about abortion policy, and they avoid it whenever possible. Democrats are talking about it as much as they can, and in fact, there's been research that's shown that more than half of the television and online advertising that Democratic candidates are doing this year, more than half of all the ads being run in the country now are on issues relating to abortion. Now for years, and we've talked about this in prior webinars, the country has been fairly closely divided on whether voters consider themselves to be pro-choice or pro-life. But since the Dobbs decision last spring, a really interesting thing has happened. Since the US Supreme Court decided to eliminate federal protections for reproductive rights, the number of voters who consider themselves pro-choice has grown dramatically, and the number who consider themselves pro-life have shrunk by similar margins. And that obviously helps Democratic candidates uh, across the board. But the other driving force that's helping Democrats so much on this issue is intramural disagreements among Republicans, not on whether abortion should be illegal or not. Republicans have become overwhelmingly a pro-life party over the last generation. But over more specific questions, for example, whether there should be exceptions in cases of rape or incest or if the mother's life is in danger, 
uh, the party, the Republican Party is in the midst of a pitch debate on those questions. And they're involved in an equally heated disagreement on whether a federal law should be passed outlawing abortion or whether these decisions ought to be made on a state to state basis. So given the voter shifts on this issue since June, and given internal Republican disagreements over the same time, nationally, voters overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly favor Democrats on the abortion issue. So let's this group, and I suspect we'll know the answer before we see it, but Katie, let's go ahead and put it up anyway. Which of the two parties do you trust more to handle issues in this area on abortion, on reproductive rights, and, on, and more broadly on health issues? Do you think the Democrats are more, should be more trusted on this issue? Should Republicans be more trusted? Both or, or neither? And let's see what our response is on this one. Well, no surprise there at all. Once again, maybe the size of the margin by a 91 to 1% differential. Um, our left-leaning group trusts Democrats much more on the issues. We have three people who weighed in who support Republicans and 8% uh, of you who don't trust either party on the issue. Now, for those of you who've been watching this webinar over the last couple of years, you know I don't make predictions. But if we set aside the poll numbers we've just seen among our group and think about national preferences, this is the prediction I will make for you. If voters decide that inflation is the most important issue to them in this election, then Republicans will regain majorities, certainly in the House and probably in the Senate as well. On the other hand, if voters decide that abortion rights is the issue that matters most to them, then Democratic chances get much better, in particular in terms of maintaining or expanding their majorities in the Senate, and while perhaps holding the House more likely keeping a Republican majority in the House, down to a very, very small margin. Now, before we wind up with our last couple of questions, just a last point I want to make on these decisions on inflation and abortion and which issue is most important to voters. Well, as you might suspect, different voters in different parts of the country and different voters from different demographic groups have come to different conclusions about which of these two issues is a great, is a more important vote made motivator for them. But the swing voters who are going to decide this election and who decide most elections are the ones whose decision on this question is the one that we should be watching most carefully when we look at public opinion polls between now and election day. Now, as all of you know, or as most of you know, there's a profound gender gap in American politics, a gender gap in which all other things considered equal, a female voter is much more likely to vote Democrat than Republican, a male voter is much more likely to vote Republican than Democrat. Now, it doesn't mean that every male votes Republican. My dad certainly doesn't. It doesn't mean that every woman votes Democrat. There's a lot of women uh, who support Republican candidates. But again, all other things considered equal, you see a lot more female support for de Democratic candidates and a lot more male support for Republicans. But the other demographic uh, differentiator that doesn't get nearly as much attention as the gender gap, and I've never understood why, is what they call the marriage gap. And the marriage gap, just like the gender gap, shows a real demographic differentiator when it comes to party preference. Single voters of either gender, all other things considered equal, are much more likely to vote for Democratic candidates than Republicans. Married voters, not all married voters, but all other things considered equal, are much more likely to vote Republican than Democrat. So what does that leave us? That leaves us with, and we're grotesquely oversimplifying here on a very complex demographic makeup of a very diverse country. But for the purposes of this discussion, we're talking about four demographic voter groups, married, when, married men, married women, single women, single men. Well, here's, so what does that mean? It means that single women, given both the gender gap and the marriage gap, are overwhelmingly more likely to vote Democratic. They're the most Democratic voting group in the electorate. Married men, on the other hand, given both a gender gap and a marriage gap, are by far the most Republican group in the electorate. Single men, and no insult, to any, no insult intended to any single men who are part of the program today, but single men tend to vote in lower numbers. They just don't pay as much attention to politics as the other groups. And so what that leaves is that leaves married female voters, 
as the ultimate group of swing voters in most elections. And if married women vote primarily on issues relating to their gender, they're much more likely to support Democ and elect Democratic candidates. If they decide to vote rather on issues devoted to their marital status, they're much more likely to support and elect Republicans. And so coming all the way back around to the two issues we've been talking about today, if married female voters around this country who are concerned greatly both about economic issues and about abortion rights, decide that economic issues are more important to them, the cost of raising their family, of paying for groceries and gasoline, if they believe that inflation and economic considerations should drive their vote, that makes the Republican chances next month much, much better. But if the Democrats are successful in convincing these married women that while inflation is certainly of some concern, but the very direct threat in many states to abortion rights is even more important to them, then they're much more likely to elect Democrats. So when we see the results four weeks from tonight, know that in all likelihood it will be married women who decided the election and they'll have decided it based on whether they decide on a national basis that inflation or abortion is the issue of greatest import to them. Last thing we're gonna do, and then I'm gonna ask Rachel to come back and we're gonna go to, and we're gonna go to your questions, is we're gonna put up two questions right in a row I'm going to ask all of you to make some predictions, and we'll ask you these same two questions again in a couple of weeks when we gather to talk about the candidates to see if any minds have changed. Uh, but KD, can we put up the first of our two questions? Right, pretty straightforward. Based on what you've heard here today and what you've been thinking about long before tonight's webinar, what do you think will be the outcome of next month's Senate elections? Do you think we'll see a large, dramatically expanded Democratic majority? And by large Democratic majority, I will say just sort of off the top of my head, let's say 53 seats or more. Do you think we'll see a small Democratic majority, 51 or 52 seats? Do you think we'll see a 50-50 tie staying in place like we have now, which for all practical purposes, because Vice President Kamala Harris can vote to break those ties, would still be the smallest of Democratic majorities? Or alternatively, do you see a small Republican majority emerging? A Republican majority of perhaps 51 or 52 seats, so a very closely fought election and still a very slim balance. Or do finally, do you see a larger Republican majority emerging of 53 seats or more? Katie, what did our group have to say about this one? Look at that. 50% say a small Democratic majority, and if you add in the 50-50 tie, which for all practices, it, practices is, as we said, the slimmest and smallest of possible Democratic majorities. 74%, almost three quarters of our group, believe that the Democrats will contain a very small margin. Now, there are small Democratic majorities and smaller ones. If the Democrats get to 52 votes, then it becomes possible that they'll be able to suspend the filibuster because even if Senators Manchin and Sinema vote against it, that's still 50 votes plus Vice President Harris. 24% uh, believe Republicans will take the majority and a very small 2% see if a, a larger Republican majority than 52 seats emerging. So we'll talk more, much more about this next month, but before we bring in your questions, Katie, let's put up our final question of the day to see what our group has to say. Okay, so we've talked about the Senate, now let's talk about the House. No such thing as a tie, at least most of the time, in a House of 435 members. So only four options here. Do you think after the election and after all the votes are counted and the elections are settled, will we see one, a large Democratic majority, we'll say 10 seats or more, an increased majority from what uh, the Democrats now have? Do you think there'll be a small Democratic majority in the low to mid single digits, which is currently what the Democrats enjoy? Do you think we'll see a small Republican majority? We'll see 10 seats or less Republican majority in which there's a Republican speaker, but perhaps not Kevin McCarthy, given the threat that he could potentially face from Donald Trump's strongest allies in the Republican caucus. Or do you think we'll see the type of larger Republican majority that was being predicted last spring, where we'll see double digits of, of, of some size margin emerging on behalf of the GOP? How do you do on this one, Katie? Very interesting and much, much closer 
Uh, 48%, just under half, say there'll be a small Democratic majority. 46%, just under 50, under half, say a small Republican majority. But if you add up those very small numbers of people who see a large House majority for one side or the other, we are exactly tied, 50 to 50. Our group is completely evenly divided on which party will nominate a speaker come January of 2023. If we had more time, we'd put up a, another question about who that speaker would be. But maybe we can get to that in a couple of weeks for our next program on October 25th. Um, in the meantime, we've gotten to the bottom of the hour. And so I will ask if uh, Rachel is willing to rejoin me. And we'll go on to what is my favorite part of the program when I stop babbling on and on and on. And we got to hear really smart questions from our really smart participants. Uh, how are the questions looking, Rachel? They're great. I'm super excited to get to them tonight. We have a lot coming in. So I thought we would start with this question from an audience member. You touched briefly on Ukraine earlier in one of the polls, but this person wants to know, what effect might the war in Ukraine have on the election? It's a really good question. And although I did put up, we did put up foreign policy as one of our options on most important issues, we didn't spend much time talking about it. And I'll, I'll offer you this. It's been interesting over the last several months how Ukraine has gone from being an, an issue that the American public is very closely following to one that, which they're aware, but not paying attention to nearly as closely. So I would bet, unfortunately for Joe Biden, because the voters do tend to give him very strong marks on how he has handled the Ukraine crisis. Unfortunately for Biden and the Democrats, it doesn't look like a lot of voters will be making their decision on foreign policy. That said, there is one potential, hopefully unlikely, but either way, extraordinary wild card that, as all of you know, Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, has been threatening in recent weeks to deploy nuclear weapons against Ukraine. And as the Russian troops continue to suffer more and more considerable losses in the war, you, uh, Putin and his advisors, hints have gotten much more pronounced. And I would suggest, obviously, we hope that this doesn't happen for all sorts of reasons, but that if Putin were to deploy even limited nuclear weapons, even in a demonstration capacity as opposed to directly trying to inflict harm on either troops or, or civilian areas, but if Putin uses nuclear weapons in any way, then I feel like, I think he'd agree that this issue is going to come back front and center for the American public. And at that point, it's more likely than not that Joe Biden, like many presidents before him, will realize somewhat of a rally around the flag effect. And if such an attack were to take place so close to the election, while the real world considerations are obviously much, much greater than the political ramifications, it probably would play to Biden's benefit. That said, as I think many of us would agree, Vladimir Putin has indicated in a number of ways that he prefers dealing with Donald Trump as president as opposed to Joe Biden. And so I think it's, entire, it's, it's worth us considering that Putin might decide that even if he chooses to deploy limited nuclear weapons, that he may wait until after November 8th in order to avoid giving Biden a considerable political boost during the middle of such closely contested elections here. Great. So staying on the topic of elections, obviously lots of questions coming in about that. Um, so one of our audience members asked, we've, we've spoken a lot about the Republican emphasis on inflation in this election season. So they asked, where's the democratic messaging about inflation and what the Democrat, Democratic Congress has done to fight it? Why is there not more emphasis on that? Well, this goes back to the type of strategic considerations we were talking about earlier. I think most leading Democratic strategists, including those advising Biden and the key congressional races, have decided that while they might be able to convince some voters that Biden deserves credit for economic growth rather than being blamed for inflation, they believe there are more political gains to be realized by emphasizing an issue on which they already maintain such a considerable advantage. So while a lot of voters aren't quite sure who to blame for the inflation, most voters are much more willing to put their trust in Democrats rather than Republicans, 
on issues relating to abortion. And given that only every campaign only has a limited window of opportunity through which to deliver a message, whether through broadcast advertising or through social media or through news media, most leading Democrats have decided that focusing on abortion rights instead of inflation is the best way to secure those victories. Now, that's not a unanimous decision. James Carville, who famously advised Bill Clinton in his presidential campaigns back in the 1990s, uh, spoke out just earlier this week, warning that Democrats should not concentrate, concentrate so completely on issues relating to abortion and ought to be talking about economic issues more in order to win back some of those working class voters who Republicans have been able to attract in recent elections. But Carville is in a pretty decided minority in the Democratic Party now. And I think while most leading Democrats do believe that they do have a good argument to make about Biden and the economy, they're much more confident in the argument they have to make about Democrats and abortion rights. Yeah, and moving to the other side of the aisle, um, we've gotten a couple of questions about OPEC's decision not to expand oil production. So one of our audience members asked, what do you make of that decision? And is it to help Republicans in the election? So as some of you know, in addition to doing these really fun webinars, I write a couple of weekly columns, uh, one for the Jewish Journal here in Los Angeles, the other for a website called All Sides, run by a friend of mine, where they print and post uh, both new, not only news, but opinions from across the uh, political spectrum from left to right. And the headline on my column this week was, quote, excuse the language in advance, Rachel, when OPEC screws over Biden. And there's no question in my mind that OPEC's decision and Saudi Arabia's decision in particular to cut back on production in order to increase oil prices was done very deliberately to harm Biden. Now, was that done specifically to harm him politically in American, the American midterm elections? Was it done to hurt the American and European end of the war effort and the Ukraine war? Was it done for their own economic considerations? Probably a, a combination of the three. But it's worth noting that in the last few days, several of the leading Democrats on Capitol Hill, most notably Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Bob Menendez, has been threatening Saudi Arabia in all sorts of ways, including cutting off our arms shipments to that country. Earlier today, the White House let it be known that President Biden was quote unquote open to those kinds of considerations. So it's very clear that Biden and his allies do feel like the Saudis made a decision very deliberately to their detriment. Um, like Putin, it's entirely possible given the uh, considerations that Trump provided during his four years in office, it's entirely possible that many Saudi leaders would prefer Trump rather than Biden as president. And certainly although Biden did travel to Saudi Arabia this spring for a somewhat uncomfortable visit, excuse me, this past summer, um, he has had some very, very harsh things to say about the Saudi leadership, including the, uh, including the crown prince. So it may have just been to, to humble Biden. It may have done to try to help out Trump's Republican allies in the midterm elections, or it may have been done as Saudi spokespersons have said, simply acting in their own economic interests. But regardless, they've got a lot of Democrats in Washington who are very, very angry at them. And I'd be very surprised if in the weeks ahead, we didn't see legislation move forward that adopted a much more aggressive and somewhat combative approach to Saudi Arabia and OPEC in general. Thank you, Dan. Um, another question coming in about the Republican side. So this audience member asked, in your perspective, is it a concern that some Republicans running for office in November favor more autocratic ideology than democratic? Okay. It is a concern. And I think the questioner framed the question the right way. Because one of the things I'll often hear is not whether I should, we should be concerned about this, but whether should, we should be frightened about this. And I think concern is the, uh, the right word choice. And I give the questioner credit for that because there are a growing number of voters, excuse me, of candidates in the Republican party who either because they truly believe it or because they simply wanna demonstrate their loyalty to Trump have questioned the outcome of the 2020 elections. 
and questioning potentially the outcomes in 2022 and 2024. My own feeling is that it's a relatively small number of Republican candidates running for Congress and Senate this year who actually believe that the 2020 election was stolen. But given that strong support from the president is the best way to ensure a motivated Republican base, a lot of these Republicans, whether they believe it in their heart of hearts or not, are towing the line for Trump because they want him complimenting them rather than criticizing him in the weeks before the election. And so the reason I'm worried, excuse me, the reason I'm concerned rather than worried is that while well, I think a lot of Republicans are delivering this message, I don't think that, I don't think that many of them, that most of them believe it. Moving on a little bit from, from that topic, um, one of our audience members asked, current guesses at any October surprise or surprises? Current guesses in October, surprise or surprises? I feel like I just want to finish saying that I didn't like to make predictions, um, but also I'll do this to hedge my bets. Uh, there are a couple of races around the country that I'd point your attention to that are much closer than most people had anticipated and are worth keeping an eye on this, are worth keeping an eye on in November. One is the campaign for US Senate in the state of North Carolina. North Carolina, at least at the federal level, has been a very deep red, heavily Republican state for many years. And while the state does tend to elect Democratic governors, it's been a long, long time since a Republican won either a US Senate seat in North Carolina or carried the state presidentially. But that said, the Democratic nominee for Senate in North Carolina, uh, former Justice Cheryl Beasley, is running almost dead even with Representative Ted Budd. And while I don't feel confident enough to predict an outcome, that is the type of race that most experts many months ago were giving to the Republicans almost automatically. And in a closely fought Senate, and we'll talk more about this next month, the races that will be most important, if Beasley were to pull off what now appears to be just a very mild upset, that could actually end up deciding which of the two parties controls the US Senate. The other race that's much closer than most people expected is in the state of Oregon, not, that, not their campaign for Senate, but for governor of Oregon. The last time Oregon elected a Republican governor was in the 1980s. It's been almost 40 years. But because there is a third party candidate in the race, they're an independent candidate who's drawing support from some more centrist Democrats. And because of voter concerns, even in a very deep blue state like Oregon, over issues like crime and homelessness, just like here in California, the Republican candidate there is running particularly close. And that, uh, in that upset, not nearly as out of the question as would have been thought of earlier in the year, would also be really important. Um, again, we'll get into much more detail on this in two weeks. But as it relates to the Senate, while upsets are always possible in almost any Senate race, it appears that while there still are seven or eight highly competitive races, it appears that control for the United States Senate has now narrowed down to three races in the state of Georgia, in the state of Nevada, and in the state of Pennsylvania. That doesn't mean that all the other races are decided, but those are the three closest. And whichever party wins two of those three Senate races, is going to have a majority in the Senate next year. In the state of Georgia, I'm guessing that most of you have been reading about the Republican nominee Herschel Walker's challenges over the last several days, and we will get into more detail on that last week. But Raphael Warnock, the Democratic incumbent, has opened up a small lead, not a big one, but a small lead as a result of some of the controversy surrounding Walker. The state of Nevada, on the other hand, uh, the challenger, former Attorney General Adam Laxalt, has opened up a small and certainly overcomable lead over Democratic incumbent Catherine Cortez Masto. But more and more uh, advisors, excuse me, more and more analysts are beginning to look at that one as leaning Republican. And what that leaves, at least possibly, to decide the entire fate of the United States Senate is the race in Pennsylvania between Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman um, and uh, former television. Uh, uh, host Mehmet Oz. That race has been rocked by both policy and health issues. And I sound like a broken record because we are going to spend a lot more time on it on the 25th. But while I don't consider either Pennsylvania or for that matter, Arizona or Georgia to be a surprise, 
Those are the three races I think most people will be watching most closely in the weeks heading up to the election. There's certainly others as well. My home state of Wisconsin, the state of Arizona, possibly even the state of New Hampshire. But keep an eye on those three in particular over the next couple of weeks, and we'll revisit them again on the 25th. So bouncing a little bit back to the issues um, that are going to decide the election, there was a question from an audience member who said, since virtually everyone is aware of the abortion issue, do you think the Democrats are spending too much time on that rather than what legislation Biden got passed that works for the majority of voters? Are they throwing away a major beneficial issue? Well, this goes back to the question uh, we discussed um, a little bit earlier in this portion of the program, is Democratic strategists do believe that they have a good argument to make on Biden's uh, impact on the economy, but they do believe, most of them, with the exception of James Carville, as I mentioned, and a few others, they do believe that abortion is an issue that can help them to an even greater degree. Now, this questioner makes a, real, put a, a really interesting twist on the point, suggesting, I think correctly, that most voters, particularly most Democratic voters, are very aware of the abortion issue and don't need to be informed on it. But at this point in a campaign, paid media messaging broadcast advertising, social media, um, and news media, news conferences, and interviews, and that, sort of, uh, and that sort of outreach. It's not really about informing voters anymore. It's about reminding them. So the question is exactly right. Most Democrats know that abortion rights are an important issue, just like most Republicans know that inflation is an important issue. But at this point, Democrats aren't introducing new information. They're simply reminding their most loyal supporters, and some of those key swing voters we talked about earlier, they're simply reminding them why the issue is so important to them to attempt to motivate them to turn out to the polls in greater numbers than they would before, than they have in the past. We know historically that Republicans tend to be more reliable voters. Republicans demographically have been older, wealthier, more conservative, more grounded in their communities. Therefore, they're more regular voters. And so Democrats have to work much harder to turn out their base. And for the Democratic base, particularly female voters, particularly young female voters, particularly voters from minority communities, again, their goal isn't to inform those voters about the importance of abortion rights, but to remind them how important it is and to get them motivated and excited to turn out in greater numbers than Democrats generally do in midterm elections. Well, moving on a little bit to a different topic that you mentioned at the top of the hour, um, we've had several questions about the issues that are happening in LA politics right now. So um, I have two questions that I think go together. Uh, so one audience member asked if you would uh, share your thoughts on the council leader's secretly recorded conversation. They said they don't live in LA, but they're still very interested in what's going on. And the other asked you to comment on the redistricting scandal involving possible illegal contact or conduct by Martinez, De Leon, and Cedillo. Um, so yeah, just generally commenting on those is... Okay. So like I said at the outset, I wanted to focus the first half of the program on national politics and the fight for Congress. One, because it is such a broad subject in and of itself. And second, because many of our audience members do come from other parts of the country. But as I also said, I was more than happy uh, to answer questions about either statewide California politics or certainly the controversies that have now roiled Los Angeles politics and government. So the first question is a relatively easy one. Um, what council member Martinez and council member De Leon talked about was absolutely reprehensible. It was unforgivable. And completely aside from the grotesque nature of the racial slurs and epithets and stereotypes, I will say just personally, I found, the entire, I found the entire incident to be extremely discouraging. Those of you who've watched these webinars before in the past know that one of the things I love about living in Southern California is that Los Angeles is the most diverse community in the history of the planet Earth. And I feel like we're in the middle of this grand experiment to see if we can find ways for people from different backgrounds and different heritages to come together to work toward common goals. And what this episode reminds me is that we're much further away from those uh, achieving those objectives. And I think many of us would have liked, uh, liked to believe. 
what we can talk about both today and in two weeks, if if you like, Rachel, since this is in your in your under your control, is we can talk either today or on the 25th about the potential impact of the controversy on the marriage race and the other local campaigns here. But the second questioner uh, raised a really important question about not whether were these comments in this controversy offensive, but were it illegal that three members of the LA City Council, uh, Kevin DeLeon, Gil Cedillos, and then Council President Nuri Martinez, were meeting behind closed doors to talk about redistricting. Now, California's uh, uh, governing uh, law as it relates to public access to government del deliberations is what's known as the Brown Act. And the Brown Act says that a majority of any governing body cannot meet in secret, that once you have more than half of those members, the public uh, does, uh, uh, it is required to give the public access. So three council members talking behind closed doors is objectionable, but given that the LA City Council contains 15 people, it's not illegal. Now that said, two of these individuals, I believe Martinez and DeLeon, although I'd have to check my notes, uh, um, are on the council's redistricting committee. And that committee is made up of, of seven uh, members of the city council. So if four of the seven members of the redistricting committee had gathered for this type of conversation, that too would have been a violation of the Brown Act and would have represented a, represented a breaking of the law. But because there was near, neither a majority of the redistricting committee or a majority of the council as a whole, it does not appear that there was any law broken, uh, just a lot of offensive and, and reprehensible language and sentiments. That that's a great point you make, Dan, um, that this could potentially have an effect on the upcoming elections. There are city council members and, and the mayor is up for elections. So um, would you mind sharing how you think that it could change the outcome of the LA elections? Well, sure. Uh, as, as, as many of you know, and for those of you who don't, I'm glad I have a chance to remind you, in a little bit over an, over an hour at seven o'clock Pacific time, uh, Rick Caruso and Karen Bass, the two remaining candidates for mayor, will be debating on KNBC, uh, the, channel, the NBC affiliate here in Los Angeles, Channel 4. And if you had asked me about that debate hmm, 72 hours ago, Rachel, I would have said that debate's going to be almost completely an argument over the issues of crime and homelessness with both Bass and Caruso, as they've done in the past, pointing out to particular controversies or scandals in their opponent's past. But I feel like because of the controversy we've been discussing, the stakes have been raised immeasurably in this debate. Whoever gets elected mayor, one of the two people on that stage tonight, their first and most important task and probably ongoing task throughout their four or eight years in office is going to be trying to find ways to reconcile these racial and ethnic divisions that have been exposed in the last few days. And listening to what Representative Bass and Mr. Caruso say, not just about what they think about what was said in that meeting. It's gonna be relatively easy for both of them to condemn those statements and those sentiments and both already have. What well, I think will be much more interesting for Angelinos is to see how these two individuals talk about how to approach this challenge going forward. Karen Bass would seem at first blush to have a, a, a pretty significant advantage on this front because before running for Congress, before running for the California State Assembly, Karen Bass uh, founded and ran an organization called Community Coalition. And if you go to the website for Community Coalition, you'll see even today that they're dedicated to strengthening ties between the Black and the Latino communities. So she has some considerable professional biographic credentials on these types of issues. On the other hand, given how bitter and divisive and raw emotions are throughout Los Angeles as a result of this controversy, it's not entirely clear that her very deep involvement in these types of matters in the past will be an advantage or disadvantage. Caruso, I will predict, will attempt to try to frame this as yet another example about what's wrong at City Hall and why we need to bring in a principled outsider. Like the debates they've had over the months on almost every other issue, the question for Los Angeles voters is, do you want someone with extensive political and government experience who's been there, but who some would argue might be part of the problem? and others would say is actually more knowledgeable on the issues and can help solve them? 
or do you want an outsider to come in who brings a fresh perspective, who may not have as much directly relevant experience, but is going to be able to come in without being bound by previous ties and alliances? I don't know what either one of them will say tonight after our program finishes. And for those of you LA World Affairs Council Town Hall members who are going to join us at six o'clock for our post-game show, we'll still have a half an hour after that to grab some quick dinner before the debate starts. And I'd encourage all of you to watch it, whether you happen to be concerned about this controversy or not, because it does appear to be the final debate before an extremely consequential local election. Well, we have time for one more question before we wrap up for the evening. So bringing it back to the national stage, uh, the Supreme Court today made a decision on a redistricting case um, and sided with Alabama on their redistricting. Uh, so one, one audience member asked, in regards to turnouts, what impact do the impediments placed on minorities, et cetera, depress their participation? Okay. So even if you separate out the Alabama decision today, which essentially said, although not to the degree that the state of Alabama wanted, said that the racial breakdown of districts should not be a major consideration it has been in past redistricting. Um, that is going to change the way districts are drawn. Um, I don't know if it's going to add, if it's going to create an additional obstacle for voters, for would be voters from minority communities deciding to participate. In in many states, states that were governed by the Voting Rights Act oversight for many years, where that oversight was lifted in recent elections, in many states where more restrictive voting access laws were passed, we've seen a really interesting and unexpected dynamic that in those states where the most restrictive new laws have been passed, voting participation has actually increased and it has increased among those communities most uh, assumed would be affected by those more stringent regulations. The reason for that is because any number of organizations, nonprofit organizations, voter registration groups, and others, once those new laws were passed, have intensified their efforts to engage in voter registration and voter turnout. Uh, so this certainly will change the way congressional districts are drawn, and I don't believe the Alabama case is the last word on this matter by any stretch of the imagination but I don't see it necessarily translating it into uh, more uh, greater obstacles for individuals from underrepresented uh, communities to, to participate in the electoral process. Thank you for that, Dan. And thank you to our audience also for submitting such great questions. Um, I know there were a lot we didn't get to, but as always, we'll cover them in our continuing the conversation segment, which will be sent out uh, later this month, so. And of course, not only do we have our continuing the conversation segment in which we'll take a few of the questions that were posted today, but not asked, but Rachel, I'll get to see you and everybody else again two weeks from today on the 25th for us to continue the conversation about the midterm elections. Yes, we're, we're really excited about that. And we also have two, as Dan mentioned earlier in the hour, we also have two programs coming up in November on November 8th and 17th. So mark your calendars. Uh, you'll be getting information about those in the next couple of weeks. So we will have plenty of time to talk about the midterm elections. And for those of you in the greater LA area, in addition to October 25th, and in addition to the two post-election programs in November, we'll also be gathering in person on November 3rd for a pre-election discussion at Akasha restaurant in Culver City. And for those of you who've been able to make it before, we hope you'll come back. And for those of you who haven't joined us uh, in the past, either prior to COVID or to the event we did just a few weeks ago, we hope you'll get up a little bit earlier and come join us for breakfast on November 3rd. So in addition to all these webinars and the continuing segment, continuing the conversation segments, we got a breakfast to bring people to, right, Rachel? Yes, very exciting. And we also have a number of other programs coming up this month. Uh, tomorrow, we have a program called The Future of Our Nation, Should Trump Be Indicted, featuring uh, Doyle McManus from the LA Times, who will be moderating for us. Uh, so that should be a really interesting conversation, uh, featuring perspectives from both sides on whether or not should, Trump should be indicted. 
Um, we also have, as uh, you may have seen on our website, which we hope you'll visit, on Monday the 17th, we also have a live stream called Upcoming Geostrategic Trends in the Indo-Pacific. So that should be a very interesting conversation given all that's happening in the Indo-Pacific right now. Um, on the 25th, Dan will be back on your screens with our, our next live stream special edition. Um, and then we also have a program which we just announced on the website um, for our members. It's a, a partnership with Caltech. Uh, the program is called um, Shaking in Our Seats, Earthquake Science on the Big Screen. It's going to be moderated by Dr. Lucy Jones, who is a revered scientist. So we hope to see you there. Um, but you can see all of this information on our website. And thank you all so much again for attending. We, we hope we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And thanks again to Dan. Always a great discussion. Thanks again to you, Rachel, and to Katie for her great work. And again, to all of you for joining us. We're grateful to you and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.